Yeah, we're going to talk about security vulnerability disclosure processes. That's a really exciting topic to some people. To me, it's a torturous topic because it tortures me. But it's still a good, that's why I put the word sane in here. We're working on a sane process. And that would be sane for us, the software providers, sane for the vendors who package our stuff, and sane for the operators who have to implement whenever we patch. Sane for everybody, that's the goal. So I'm curious, uh, how many of you are people who have to patch when there's a vulnerability? OK, are any of you vendors who include bind in your stuff? No. OK, are any of you people who uh, find or be, would be curious about finding security vulnerabilities and reporting them to companies and knowing the right way to do that? Few. OK, that tells me some about which way to go here. And that's good, because I think I have, I have it going the right way. Uh, that's me. That's an old, bad picture of me. That's where you can find me. Uh, and I do sometimes tweet about this kind of stuff. But it could also be about my kids or gluten-free cookies, just warning you. Um, <laughs> so OK, we're going to talk a tiny bit about who ISC is, vulnerability disclosure terminology, a little bit of history and context, what we do now, a tiny bit about what we used to do and what we do now, and where we're going, what we're implementing. Uh, and then a little bit about an interesting conundrum we've come up with because we, of the way we disclose stuff and the fact that we use test-driven development and how our community would like us to handle that, and I want your input. And then if you're interested, we can talk about the last big DNS bind vulnerability and updates related to that. Is, are people interested in that? Are you concerned about it? Some, okay. So we'll, we'll do that at the end. Um, okay. Some people know ISC, some people don't, so this is like my really quick ISC thing. Um, ISC is a nonprofit organization that makes open source software. We also do open source operations. Uh, we run fruit, which is one of the root name servers. We make bind, which is on about 85% of the name servers in the world. Um, we also make ISC DHCP and other software, some of which is listed up there. We have recently branched more into routing, open source routing, and we have a new forum called the Security and Resiliency Forum, which is about security-related software. That's uh, SIE and RPV, for those of you who might know anything about those. Um, we back all of that up with various professional services, which I'm not going to go into right now. But uh, if you're interested in support or training on Bind or DHCP, we are the experts, and you can come talk to us. And, uh, our, benef our public benefit services are extensive. That's some of them. We do a lot of standards driver, standards driving, ITF protocol development work, talking at this sort of organization. We do a lot of process and protocol in public. And this actually, this effort that I'm talking about today is an effort in that direction to build what we consider a sane way to handle these kinds of issues and to put it out in the public so that everyone can use it. So, OK, vulnerability disclosure terminology. It's basically how people manage vulnerabilities. Uh, there is, this is not how everybody does it. And we'll get into how various people do it. But somebody reports a vulnerability, or, or one is found internally. You determine something, or someone reports one to you, or one shows up on the internet in public. Once we were at an IETF, and someone found one on a Debian mailing list. That was really fun. Uh, and I had been at the company like three days, so I couldn't figure out what was going on at all. Anyway, um, in the first phase, the vulnerability is found. We always go back to the finder and communicate with them. And then we need to validate and replicate the problem. We resolve it with workarounds, patches, and fixes. And then there's responsible disclosure and a call to action in the community. And how that's done is different in different places. So there's a lot of different kinds of vulnerability disclosure. Uh, we're going to go into these in more detail. Full disclosure. So it means detail, exposing all the details. It's basically exactly the opposite of the security through obscurity model. This is uh, telling everybody everything. And it usually means that all the information is made immediately public. So this is good for some people and problematic for others, I would say. Um, and it can be very problematic for everyone because, of course, the black hats might find the information before you do. 
Um, so responsible disclosure is a stance which some vendors and software developers always have. And um, basically, the, that is that the, the uh, details should be given to the authors and or vendors and only to the authors and or vendors and that you should never disclose publicly and they frequently don't ever disclose any details publicly. That's not an uncommon stance among people that make software. Um, and it's one that also, in my opinion, has problems, different problems. So public disclosure, um, this is when a company makes the news of the issue public. Uh, Cisco sometimes does this, Oracle sometimes does this. This is done a lot by companies who have tons of people who use their stuff, but they don't necessarily have any contractual relationship with those people. So they don't necessarily have the ability to do an advance notification, but there's tons of those people, so they just put it out there. And they are the, they are the ones making the hardware, so it's, they're not in the situation, for example, that we're in where there are lots of um, operating systems and appliance vendors who include our software in their hardware. Okay, entitled disclosure. Now we get into the, the whole model of if you're going to tell, if you as the company who has the issue is going to tell someone ahead of time about the problem, who are you going to tell and by what criteria, right? So um, this, uh, what was typo? Security bulletins only accessible to customers and partners of the vendor with a legal agreement. So this could mean various things. Uh, this, is, this is how Juniper does it and some other folks. Um, basically, you can limit access to customers and partners. Uh, you can not, sometimes they, they do a whole process and they will actually make a public statement, but they won't broadcast it. They won't advertise it broadly, put it in the news, do security aliases, press releases, any of that stuff. Uh, or sort of a no deniability version. If they're asked, they give information, but they don't give information otherwise. Then we have um, stuff like the critical notification plan. This is something that has been done. It's problematic because uh, uh, who, who gets notified is, is complicated. Who is critical infrastructure? Um, in DNS, there are some people who are obviously critical infrastructure, like root operators if it's an authoritative side attack. Um, but then you get into, okay, so CT TLDs and then other TLDs and then now there's gonna be a bazillion new TLDs and then there's, if you get fits a recursive side attack, then it's much more complicated because you've got loads of commercial recursive server farms and who are the, who are the critical infrastructure people you would notify? Uh, there's a link there and these slides will be available later that gets into a lot of discussion on this. Um, it's complicated, basically. A partner notification plan is a system to notify and prepare channel partners ahead of time. So it's um, all under contracts and NDAs, and this is how Patch Tuesday works. If you're part of the program, you get notification ahead of time and you get ready and then Patch Tuesday happens and you've already got your whatever it is up to date. Um, it's this Microsoft thing. And, uh, and Adobe does a similar thing, I guess. I'm not as familiar with Adobe's version. This works, it only works really well for people who are part of their system and that involves buying, you know, buying whatever that membership is, so. Um, now, phase disclosure is the term that we have for what we're trying to do. Uh, it's an evolution of the idea of responsible disclosure, which we talked about. Um, and the idea is that there's really two kinds of risk in this situation. There's, well, there's the risk of the vulnerability itself, but then there's operational risk Sometimes having to run an upgrade is as big of a risk as whatever the vulnerability might have been, right? For various reasons. Um, so if we can make the disclosure phased and more rational, it gives people more opportunity to upgrade in a sane way. Um, and so basically it's increasingly larger numbers of organizations being uh, notified. Okay, so we're gonna get into how, we're, how we've done things and how we're going to do things, and some questions about maybe how you would like us to do things, and then we can just talk. Okay, um, so we had 
what we what one would call an entitled disclosure process, where basically the people who heard about a security vulnerability early were people who are members of our software forums. Some of you may be members of the BIND forum or the DHCP forum. Um, that's not gonna change. Those people will still get early notifications. So don't worry if you're one of those folks, because it's important, right? We understand that. Um, but it is, it can be problematic to only notify those folks early of a security issue. Um, so we, because, we, because we're on 85% of the name servers in the world and DHCP is also very, very widely used, um, we really have an obligation to internet infrastructure and we really have, we feel a responsibility to the uh, vendors and operating system uh, folks who package our stuff, whether or not they're members of ISE. Of course, we really want everyone to be members of ISE. We're a nonprofit, and we need we need the support. But we have an obligation to the internet community as well. Um, so, basically, we have two things we're trying to do with this, and the first one is, yeah, as I was saying, the objective to provide the opportunity to upgrade within a reasonable maintenance window, as opposed to upgrade now, now, no now, and. Uh, and someone, as someone said to me this morning, you always manage to do these right after we complete a software development cycle, right after, every time. <laughs> I said, it's our talent. So um, we, as it says here, we're, we're trying to balance the risk of rushed upgrades with the risk of the vulnerability. So how long of a window we provide, for example, is highly dependent on the severity of the risk. Um, and as an open source organization, we're not just an open source software company, we're really an open culture organization. We are working to have all of our vulnerability management processes be public, and we're hoping that they can provide reference for the industry as to a sane way to do this. And we like to think that as a nonprofit open source company, we're in a sort of a more neutral zone for people to discuss this without quite as much company politics. We like to think that. Okay, so our vulnerability management process basically has five things. So this is very similar to what I said before about the sort of standard phases, but there's a little more detail in terms of how we do stuff. Um, the report from the finder. We always, we always acknowledge and communicate with the finder. If possible, I or someone else, Cora and our team, will call them on the phone and talk to them. We wanna make sure that it's the real deal. We wanna make sure they understand the importance of um, not disclosing the issue publicly. And we want to always ask them if they'll test for us and we want to ask them if they want credit. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't want credit, but we give credit to people who find the bug if, if they want it. Um, and if you are ever so lucky, unlucky, whatever, as to find one of these things, um, the way to report to us is to use our security-officer at isc.org email list, and we do have a PGP key on our website which you can use. That is the best way to report security issues to most, most companies have some method like that where you can send stuff in, and that is definitely the sanest way. If you're not sure, just don't put it on a public list. Don't post it to bind users if you just think it might be a security issue, please. That happens. Um, so then we acknowledge, we validate internally. We do something called CVSS scoring. The CVSS I'll get into more later, but that's the common vulnerability scoring system, which is a NIST tool which rates security issues and uh, also has a tool where you can put in your own environmental factors and come up with a number and management people like this. You can also demonstrate to them later that you've reduced the risk by doing things. You've patched, there's a fix, it's not, there's no active exploits, whatever, the number will go down. This will make your managers happier as it goes down from nine to three or something. Um, and I'll tell you more about that. Um, and then replication just means that we have, um, in test-driven development, we write a test, we write code, we run the test again to show that we fixed it. Um, vulnerability resolution is, so we, we try to provide patches and completely fixed code and workarounds where they're possible. Also during that phase, we're drafting the security advisory. We use a standard uh, format for that, which I have a reference for later. It's called the Common Vulnerability Framework. I think I'm getting that right. Um, which is just a bunch of different things you say about the vulnerability and there's like standardized terms so that everybody knows what everybody's talking about. Uh, and the CVE number, uh, that's the, there's an identifier system. It's run by MITRE the, and um, everybody who has these kinds of issues obtains these numbers and it's a standard way you can find them. And then there are databases of them that are maintained and you can keep track of what's going on. 
if you ever have one of these issues in your own company, uh, write to MITRE and they'll give you a CVE number. And some companies have their own list of them, and some people are also authorized to give them out. Um, we, we may do that at some point. Um, phase disclosure, so I'm gonna go into this but in a minute. It's uh, how, we, how we reach out to the infrastructure partners, security people, vendors, and customers. Then uh, after we do those phases, we go public, and we try to go as broadly as possible. One thing we're doing now is, uh, even with our limited resources, we're trying to localize. We've observed that when we localize a version of the CVE, we get a huge spike from people in the areas of the world where they speak that language. So it actually seems to really matter. We like to think that the internet operates in English, but it clearly doesn't. So <laughs> um, we also always do postmortems, And I would strongly recommend that anyone who's getting into this kind of stuff always do that because we always learn things every single time. Even when it seems really straightforward, which does actually happen sometimes. Okay, Just, uh, there's two different variants to this process. Um, a type one incident is uh, if, it's handled, if it's handled appropriately and discreetly, we use normal vulnerability management processes. Um, but the other issue is if there's a live operational issue or public disclosure of the vulnerability, that's type two. So the issue that we had recently, um, it wasn't that someone disclosed it to us, it was that servers started falling down, 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 and at 11 o'clock at night in California. So pagers started going off, off, off. And uh, so we consider that a type two incident and we would move very quickly to notify everybody. Um, but we do try to give early warning to critical infrastructure folks, um, just for sanity, but we notify everybody as quickly as we can in that situation. And actually in the most recent situation, we sent out a notification before we had patches just that we were aware of what was going on. And then we sent out mitigation patches and now we're working on final code resolution. Um, so this is just a note that if there's an incident impacting DNS operations at multiple sites that we know about, we will treat it as if it's a security issue until we've confirmed that it's not malicious because we don't know and we take them seriously. Um, so assuming that it's a more sane situation, and uh, well, like we had a DHCP issue that just came out yesterday. Uh, so it was disclosed to us very privately, and we went through this exact process. And we went through all the steps that I was talking about earlier. We validated it, we talked to the finder, we came up with patches. And so then the first thing we do in terms of disclosure is we send email to our forum subscribers, software support customers, and when, when it's applicable, we send a note to the DNS root operators. Um, in this case, it was a DHCP issue, so of course they don't really, they might care, but they don't care as root operators. <laughs> so um, that happens about a week before we send out the final notification. We would like to extend that to a longer time, but it's, um, it's sort of dependent on our resources and the needs of the community. Um, and then the second phase is, <coughs> right, this is how it is right now. A day before the public notification, we send information to uh, global security tracking organizations, so CSERTs and FIRSTs, these are all over the world, security organizations that have their own systems for tracking this stuff. And then um, we also at the same time actually send something to vendors who package our code into their operating systems, appliances, and other products. Um, it's again about 24 hours before. Uh, as I'll mention later, we're working to change this actually. Uh, if those vendors are software forum members, they get notification in the first phase. So they're getting a benefit. Um, and then the final phase is the public disclosure and release of patched versions of all currently supported affected code. So, um, and then the, the other thing that happens after that is there's an extensive communication phase where I'm answering questions for weeks generally about this stuff. Um, and I, we try to respond to everybody. If you ever have any, a question about any security issue we have, if you write the security officer, you will get a personal reply. Um, so things that affect this version of disclosure for issues. One is um, there's, you have to have two kinds of functioning trust so contractual trust, obviously, if we have an NDA with you, we have a contractual trust relationship. But operational trust is trickier. Working discreetly through the remediation uh, basically just means dealing with the whole, the whole cycle of this process. It's really important, and 
if there's a leak in disclosure, it, it just mungs up the whole thing. Because if you had planned, oh, well, we have a week, and our window is Friday, and then someone announces, someone who had heard from us about the issue, you know, puts it on a list on Thursday, you're screwed, right? Your pager's going off, and that sucks. So um, very few vendors actually use the phase disclosure pr approach because of this. Um, it, it's a challenge, but we really think it's important. Um, so we have non-disclosures with our support service and forum contacts, and that's part of why they're phase one now. Um, but we don't necessarily have NDAs with other organizations. This is an open issue. Okay, so um, the other thing is uh, not everybody uses PGP. In this room, probably we have more PGP clue than in many rooms, but people are often really confused <laughs> when we ask them for their PGP key so we can write them back about a security issue. And it's um, also not easy to, to securely guarantee exchange of keys with people you don't know out on the internet, right? So um, this is a thing. There are some possibilities of ways to remediate this too, but I'm not really gonna go into that right now. Um, so in terms of what we wanna do to improve what we're doing, um, we are, as I said before, we're rolling out uh, multiple languages for security advisories. Um, we're working with folks we work closely with already, like in the CCTLD community. We have, we have colleagues at JPRS and CNNIC and other organizations who translate for us and also various universities. And we have a lot of international staff at ISC. I think we had six languages for the last big one. Um, and we wanna push out our phase one disclosure to seven business days before the public release instead of five. Um, and then this last thing is big and if any of you are working for vendors or have relationships with vendors who you think we should be talking to, let me know. We really want to have all of those folks in phase one because we want to have code, you know, we wanna have your RHEL code ready for you when we disclose or your Ubuntu code or whatever. We don't want there to be a delay between our release of the code and everyone else's release of the code because that causes a problem for people. Um, that is how Microsoft and ICASI do things now, and we would like to do that. Um, so, more things. Um, the, we may develop more relationship with national C-certs. The national C-certs have a pretty clear view on who is critical infrastructure inside of their country, and that would be an acceptable metric for us as to how to decide who that kind of person would be. Um, and, um, oh, that's redundant. Sorry. Uh, we are working on doing more communication with customers and also just users about the process. And so we actually did some online sessions this week and I'm here today and we're just trying to talk about this more and, and get it working right. Um, and we're gonna put, hmm, what am I talking about? We're gonna put the, uh, the processes and procedures in our knowledge base. The ISC now has a knowledge base which has actually a lot of useful information for sysadmins. I'll have a link later, you can check it out. Um, and then we want to use the common vulnerability reporting framework, as I mentioned. This is a, a standard way to, to write your CVEs, which decreases confusion, which will in turn help me because I'll get less emails to security officer from confused people, I'm hoping. We'll see. Okay, so um, I want to go into a little tangent about TDD and vulnerability disclosure. Um, so... There we go. Um, so ISC uses test-driven development extensively. Test-driven development is an agile process, um, basically where you write a test, write a very small unit of code, which is to do with that same issue, and then run the test to prove that you fixed the issue. Um, and we um, currently, when we do that for an issue that's a security vulnerability, we then pull the test. Um, Normally we ship our tests, they're regression tests, we think our customers and users want them and use them. But the issue is that this test would basically tell you how to exploit the code. So um, we need to figure out if and when there is an appropriate time to, to ship this test. And um, we are actively, hmm, sorry, my, my remote's not working. 
Um, we are actively seeking feedback on this. So um, that, that's the biggest change for the sort of 2.0 version of our vulnerability disclosure process. And um, there's two issues there. One is operators ask us for the test all the time. And there's a reason for that. People want to make sure they're not vulnerable, right? And then um, it would definitely make it easier to build an exploit. It would make it quite easy for, for people who want to do that, I think. Um, so we need to figure out how and when we're going to do that. And then we need to provide training to make it really clear to people how to deal appropriately with it. And we need to improve our communications. The problem we struggle with is that our software is so widely deployed and we have communications with a very small percentage of those people. And we don't want to screw them over by doing this. Um, and we need to talk more with the certs and the, um, and the first community about it. Um, and then, so basically we're asking, and if you guys have thoughts on this, we can talk a little bit. Um, yeah. Use the microphone so that the streaming people can hear you. Um, how do you ensure then that a change you make in the future doesn't reopen a bug? Do you keep these tests internal? Yes, but just they're regression tests, and we will always run them, even if okay. we haven't published them. Um, so the question is, what would we need to do that would make people comfortable with us shipping these tests? What do they? What do you need to do to make you know to be comfortable? Would this be? Would this impact your operations? And what would be the appropriate time frame? If you have thoughts on that, you could share them with me today or also send me an email. I have cards. OK. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the CVSS as a tool. I think this is useful both if you're an operator and you want to use the CVSS system inside your organization. We always provide the equation link so that you can generate your own CVSS score for our issues. But people may also find this useful if you come up with your own security issue. Um, it's an industry standard tool that improves communications for risk and disclosure. Um, and it also uh, sort of neutralizes the discussion. Sometimes people come to us and they say, I have this really serious bug. And we look at it and we run this thing and we're like, hmm, that's really not a serious bug. And it used to be that we would just sort of argue where we would just tell them what we thought and they would go away eventually or something. And now we have sort of a, well, you know, the NIST standard says this is a two. Right, which makes it a little easier to say go away. Or this standard says this is a nine. Please don't talk to anyone. Please go to your bunker for 24 days. You know. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> we always uh, now include the CVSS base score, and I'll go into that uh, in our security advisory, which provides um, uh, sort of a common, understood level of severity for the issue. Um, basically, the CVSS uses um, a bunch of metrics and formulas that can be used to assess risk. So it's not um, going to tell you your precise risk until you enter in some, some further data, which I will show you. Uh, so we create the base score, um, which is based on sort of intrinsic issues to a vulnerability that don't change over time. Um, what kind of software this can affect, whether it's network, whether it requires passwords or not, this kind of thing. Um, and then the temporal score is um, things that can change over time. This is an active exploit. This is not an active exploit. I have patches. I don't. Um, and then the environmental score is specific to your environment, um, things that might make it more or less severe depending on your operational situation. And then um, if you. When you enter these two things, then you have the final one. We always do base, and we will do temporal, although you can adjust temporal. And then environmental is always on the user end. Um, so the CVSS is used by CSERT CERT teams all over the world for a bunch of stuff. It's a, it's a NIST standard, so it's an American standard, but it's used in a lot of places now. Um, so. You can you know, assign, people have processes based off of this, based on how many resources they assign to it, what images will be fixed, whether we need an advisory, how to communicate risk, all of this kind of stuff. And a lot of organizations have set processes based off of this number. And we have some. 
there they are. So uh, you know, your your whatever the base score is, and we just use the base score for our decision making process. Um, we will either you know if it's really low, we'll just fix it, move forward, and not actually do an advisory. If it's up to four, we would fix it, but not do an advisory. The lowest one, we don't do anything, or we just we we you know it's we fix it, but it's no deal, and. Um, and then the next one, we fix it, but we don't do an advisory. And then starting at five, we do an advisory. The truth is that the nature of DNS is such that we very rarely have an issue below five. If we get an issue, it's usually a high level issue. Um, because a lot of the ones that would be rated lower in the CVSS would be, would be issues that don't affect networks and DNS, it just always does. So um, we have had a few. Okay, am I, I guess I'll take some questions now. I'm wondering why I put this here instead of later. And then um, I have a few references and then we can talk about the specific DNS issue or the, the most recent DHCP issue if people have questions about those. Do you guys have questions about any of that which I just whizzed through? Mildly brain numbing, I realize. Very processy. Um, okay, cool. So um, I'll give out these slides, but if you're interested in any of these tools or you think your organization would find them useful or you just really like nerdy NIST calculators, there you go, enjoy. I spend time with them and they're fun, let me tell you. Okay, if you wanna keep in contact with ISC through social media, which some people seem to really wanna do, that's how you do it. Okay, um, and then um, this is some ISC things, uh, the knowledge base is deepthought.isc.org or kbe.isc.org. Um, it is articles about many things. It is substantially user-oriented articles about BIND, DHCP, SIE, RPZ, and SMS. So if you are a sysadmin who deals with those kinds of things, you may wanna check this out, and it is free. Um, BIND Announce is an email alias, which if you are a BIND user, I highly, highly recommend. It is only release announcements, so it is low volume. And uh, Bind Users is not low volume. Bind Users is a community resource for people who use Bind, and it is very useful, but uh, if you don't want lots of mail, you probably want the digest. Um, okay, I'm gonna take some questions before we go to the CVE stuff. Yes. Hi, Eric Radman with DE Shaw Research. Is, the con is it really a consensus that shipping the unit tests makes it easier for attackers because you're not actually developing a network level tool, right? It's unit testing, so it's kind of just the flip side of the patch you just provided anyway. That's, that's true. So and I'm not sure it makes it easier because you wouldn't read the unit test, you'd read the patch, I would think. And, you, and, that, and, well, and that's the thing, is just being an open source company does, of course, open yeah. that up. But um, so is there like some debate it, as to whether it's risky it's, or? I think it's a fair debate. Yeah. Some people feel that it's risky. Yeah. I am of the opinion that we should, should be, that we should just be shipping them actually, yeah. honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I think it's useful. Yeah. So, um, but it is an open debate and, I, and I'm encouraging people's voices and yours is so, noted. Right, so, so but if you're asking the question, some I people am. are obviously pretty nervous about it, so there's gotta be cases probably when probably it makes it easier. Yeah, I think Maybe, you know. we have certainly had cases where the test is essentially the vector, but okay. we also have cases where it's not. So right. that is another possible thing to do is, is ship the test when it's appropriate and yeah. not ship it when it's not or ship it much later when it's yeah. not. Right, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. How much coverage does your code have from tests currently? Um, that's a great question. So I didn't go into a lot on test-driven development. Um, by nine has only been doing TDD for the last 18 months. So the legacy code does not have test coverage. Um, the new code does. Bind 10 has had TDD from the beginning of its development, so it will be very different in test coverage. It has nearly 100% test coverage. Um, yeah, but by 9 absolutely does not. That was not a concept in the Bind 9 engineering world when Bind 9 was first written. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, my 
Stram. I'm uh, from uh, Research in Motion. Okay, cool. Um, so I feel your pain about uh, releasing and, uh, yeah. and also that it must be nice to occasionally have people who are willing to discuss the vulnerability with you before releasing it or selling it. It's much nicer, <laughs> yes. Um, I, I, I hope that people will read this and think about it. Yeah, no, and, and I, I know some people in my office who are probably very interested in yeah. that procedure. Um, but yeah, with the re release of, uh, uh, of uh, not not releasing the unit test or whatever you have, um, yeah, all the all the people that I work with, the security researchers, um, the they're a, a more or less of the opinion that once you've released the patch, that's the same thing. Okay. That 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 you just dip the code and look for things, and even worse or better. Um, uh, they will look for similar patterns yes. in the code that you have patched yes. in case you did not miss in the case you missed one. But that's no. something that we can go <coughs> into. That's highly relevant, actually, to the to the most recent security issue. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know there was a BlackBerry exploit that that well it's from WebKit, but the same thing same thing happened. Yeah. That we got one patch, but missed another example of that. Yes. Thank you. Anything else for now? All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about the most, this, this is the most recent DNS CVE. People seem to be interested in that. Um, and we can talk about whatever else related to this or ISC stuff or whatever, too. Okay, so um, what happened in this situation was basically that uh, a cluster of organizations across the internet reported crashes interrupting service on binary name servers performing recursive queries. Uh, and effective server, affected servers crashed after logging an error in query.c with an insist. That's where the pattern comes in. Um, multiple versions were reported as being affected, including all currently supported released versions of BI9. And I would like to clarify this affects all versions of BI9. So if you are naughty and running old BI9, you are not safe. You are just naughty. Um, so get safe. Thank you. Um, ISC investigated the root cause and produced patches which prevent the crash. They are not actually, they do not actually fix the issue, the current patches, they are mitigation patches. Um, the time window of the crash was limited and not repeated. This is important in figuring out something that we did determine, which is that we worked with the security community and we figured out the, the cause. And we talked to the folks who seemed to be at the source of it and we determined that it was an unforeseen operational interaction and nothing actually malicious happened. Um, the truth is that you can get domino effects with DNS, basically. Um, so it was a previously unknown bug in bind that caused an internal consistency which led to the crash. Um, and it has to do with how we handle um, that specific kind of issue and insists, right? So, um, the, no, the original trigger for this incident no longer is, exists, but it is possible that the same set of circumstances could be made to recur deliberately. So basically, it's still a security issue, and therefore, everybody needs to patch um, to, up, to upgrade if you haven't. We have up-to-date versions on the website, and please do, because this was very, this was very big in the press, and we, I'm, I'm sure people will be trying to exploit it. Um, so we kept the base score at 7.8, which is pretty high. And that's an example of the equation that if you use the calculator and you add in your own factors, you can come up with your own company's score. Um, okay, so that's the versions affected, all of them. Uh, the recommendation is to patch. Solution is, there's the patch locations, but there is a workaround. Um, this may be useful if some of you have patch windows that are difficult. I don't know if this is even still really relevant, but maybe. Um, if you turn on minimal responses, which is a slightly obscure bind knob, we have many obscure knobs, um, you can use this for purely recursive servers and forwarders. Um, it removes optional portions of the responses and can cause more queries to be sent, um, but you really should patch. It is safer. This, this may help. Um, so, oh, this is an old slide. I'm going on. Um, and why, okay. 
I apologize. I, I edited the first section of slides in here very heavily from the ones I had used earlier this week, and then these ones, not so much. Um, but this gives you more information about CVSS and CVE, which um, I think is useful. So this, there's another section I can go over here if you guys are interested. It's about sort of why insists have become a place where security issues show up in Bind 9 and how we're handling exceptions in Bind 10 to avoid them. Yes? No? Something else? Questions? What time is it? Mm. Sure, we'll go through them. Why not? This is not my, this section is not my slides. It's our by 9 engineering manager slides. So if we get really technical, I may not, I may have to defer your question to him. But there we go. So um, in bind 8, some of you will remember that there were lots and lots of root exploit CVs. We were famous. Or they were famous. I wasn't there. But um, when Bind 9 was designed, that was a huge goal to avoid that. Um, it detects abnormal situations. It detects programmer errors. It tries to react appropriately. Sometimes the best action is, or at least was at the time that the system was designed, to crash. Uh, Bind 10 is different. In specificity, Bind 10 is written in C++ and it has exception handling, C++ does. And that has allowed the developers to handle these issues very differently. And we think that bind 10, in combination, that, that change in combination with the fact that it's a modular system and each module can be brought back up after it goes down by a master process called the boss of bind, um, those two things together should make bind 10 much more resilient to these kinds of issues than bind 9 is. That's the dream. So um, this particular CVE was related to internal data structures. By nine detects an abnormal situation that wasn't expected by the programmer. Um, and so the fix in the patch is to handle the edge case properly without crashing, but there will be a more complete fix, which should also deal with related edge cases. And we're actually not going to do another security bump for that. It's just going to go into a regular version because we feel that the mitigation patch has kept everyone safe and that doing another security version would cause a lot of unnecessary operational stress with emergency upgrades. We really do want to minimize organizational stress. So um, this is just a little bit about the finder and the relationship with the finder. Um, it used to be we would get information from the finder, write a fix, maybe do some tests, and then release. The end. Um, so now. We interact with the finder to try to really understand the issue. We write tests to identify the flaw. We write the fix. We confirm the tests pass. Then we go back to the finder and make sure that the, test, that the fix solves their issue. And then we release using the policy that we just discussed. There's a lot of change in there, and it's actually a lot better for us, and we like to think for everybody else. Um, OK, so we talked about TDD, so I don't know if I'm really going to go into this. I think I'm just going to take questions. But yeah, we've talked about this. Um, are there more questions or concerns or anything? Are we done? Um, oh, yeah. And then when you're done, and then I have a, a slightly tangential thing I want to say. This is just curiosity, but yeah. does the choice of C++ slow the adoption of bind in operating systems, which are which don't usually have that in their core? Mm. It is a very good question, and it may. Um, we are just getting to the point now where we are ready to start serious conversations with operating system vendors about Bind 10. We have already done some, and we have heard from, we have heard both, it will not be a problem, and it will be a problem. Um, sometimes from the same company. Um, almost. It's fascinating, isn't it? Um, so are there more questions? The last thing I wanted to say is that I am um, meeting one-on-one -on -one with folks, well, I'm at Lisa, about gripes, wants, whatever, for that you have, might have about BIND or DHCP. And um, I'm here still all day tomorrow, and I have time. So if anyone is interested, here's my card. And I have stickers, BIND 10 stickers, if anyone wants one. That's it. Thank you for your time. <laughs>